pharmacological treatment. General principles when using overactive bladder drugs. When offering anti-mascarinic drugs to treat overactive bladder, always take account of the women's coexisting conditions, for example, poor bladder emptying, use of other existing medication affecting the total anticholinergic load, and risk of adverse effects. Before overactive bladder drug treatment starts, discuss with women the likelihood of success in associated common adverse effects and the frequency and route of administration, and that some adverse effects such as dry mouth and constipation may indicate that treatment is starting to have an effect and that they may not see the full benefits until they have been taking the treatment for four weeks. Prescribe the lowest recommended dose when starting a new overactive bladder drug treatment. If women's overactive bladder drug treatment is effective and well tolerated, do not change the dose or drug. Choosing overactive bladder drugs. Do not use flavoxate, propantheline, and imipramine for the treatment of urinary incontinence or overactive bladder in women. Do not offer oxybutynin immediate release to frail older women. Offer one of the following choices first to women with overactive bladder or mix urinary incontinence. Oxybutynin immediate release or tolterodine immediate release or darafinacin once daily preparation. If the first treatment for overactive bladder or mixed urinary incontinence is not effective or well tolerated, offer another drug with the lowest acquisition cost. Offer a transdermal overactive bladder drug to women unable to tolerate oral medication. Reviewing overactive bladder drug treatment. Offer a face-to-face -face or telephone review four weeks after the start of each new overactive bladder drug treatment, ask the woman if she is satisfied with the therapy. If improvement is optimal, continue treatment. If there is no or suboptimal improvement or intolerable adverse effects, change the dose or try an alternative overactive bladder drug and review again four weeks later. Offer review before four weeks if the adverse events of overactive bladder drug treatment are intolerable. Review women who remain on long-term drug treatment for urinary incontinence or overactive bladder annually in primary care or every six months for women over 75. Offer referral to secondary care if overactive bladder drug treatment is not successful or stop the medicine and consider other treatment modalities. Desmopressin The use of desmopressin may be considered specifically to reduce nocturia in women with urinary incontinence or overactive bladder who find it a troublesome symptom. Use particular caution in women with cystic fibrosis and avoid in those over 65 years with cardiovascular disease or hypertension. Duloxetine Serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor or SNRI Do not use duloxetine as a first-line treatment for women with predominant stress urinary incontinence. Although it may be offered a second-line therapy, if women prefer pharmacological to surgical treatment, or are not suitable for surgical treatment. If duloxetine is prescribed, counsel women about its adverse effects, such as fatigue. If duloxetine is prescribed, counsel women about its adverse effects, such as fatigue, nausea, diarrhea, constipation, drowsiness, sedation, headache, serostomia or dry mouth. Estrogens. Do not offer systemic hormone replacement therapy for the treatment of urinary incontinence. Offer intravaginal estrogens for the treatment of overactive bladder symptoms in postmenopausal women with vaginal atrophy. 
The multidisciplinary team for urinary incontinence should include a urogynecologist, a urologist with a subspecialist interest in female urology, a specialist nurse, a specialist physiotherapist, a colorectal surgeon with a subspecialist interest in functional bowel problems for women with coexisting bowel problems, and a member of the care of the elderly team and or occupational therapist for women with functional impairment. When recommending optimal management, the multidisciplinary team should take into account the woman's preference, past management, comorbidities, treatment options including further conservative management such as overactive bladder drug therapy, invasive procedures for overactive bladder, inform any women wishing to consider surgical treatment for urinary incontinence about the benefits and risk of surgical and non-surgical options, their provisional treatment plan, include consideration of the women's childbearing wishes in the counseling, offer invasive therapy for overactive bladder and or stress urinary incontinence symptoms only after an multidisciplinary team review, botulinum toxin A, offer bladder wall injection with botulinum toxin A to women with overactive bladder caused by proven detrusor overactivity that has not responded to conservative management. Discuss the risk and benefits of treatment with botulinum toxin A with women before seeking informed consent, covering the likelihood of being symptom-free or having a large reduction in symptoms, the risk of clean intermittent catheterization, and the potential for it to be needed for variable lengths of time after the effect of the injections has worn off, the absence of evidence on duration of effect between treatments and the long-term efficacy and risk, and the risk of adverse effects, including an increased risk of urinary tract infection. Start treatment with botulinum toxin A only if women have been trained in clean intermittent catheterization, have been trained in clean intermittent catheterization, and have performed the technique successfully and are able and willing to perform clean intermittent catheterization on a regular basis for as long as needed. Use 200 units when offering botulinum toxin A. Consider 100 units of botulinum toxin A for women who would prefer a dose with a lower chance of catheterization and accept a reduced chance of success. If the first botulinum toxin A treatment has no effect, discuss with the multidisciplinary team. If botulinum toxin A treatment is effective, offer follow-up at 6 months or sooner if symptoms return for repeat treatment without a multidisciplinary team referral. Tell women how to self-refer for prompt specialist review if symptoms return following a botulinum toxin A procedure. Offer repeat treatment as necessary. Do not offer botulinum toxin B to women with proven detrusor overactivity. Percutaneous sacral nerve stimulation. Offer percutaneous sacral nerve stimulation to women after multidisciplinary team review if their overactive bladder has not responded to conservative management including drugs and botulinum toxin A and they are unable to perform clean intermittent catheterization. Consider percutaneous sacral nerve stimulation after multidisciplinary team review if a woman's overactive bladder has not responded to conservative management, including drugs, and botulinum toxin A. Discuss the long-term implications of percutaneous sacral nerve stimulation with women, including the need for test stimulation and probability of the test success, the risk of failure, the long-term commitment, the need for surgical revision, and the adverse effects. Augmentation cystoplasty Restrict augmentation cystoplasty for the management of idiopathic detrusor overactivity to women whose condition has not responded 
to conservative management and who are willing and able to self-catheterize. Preoperative counseling for the woman or her carer should include common and serious complications such as bowel disturbance, metabolic acidosis, mucus production, and or retention in the bladder, urinary tract infection, and urinary retention. Discuss a small risk of malignancy occurring in the augmented bladder. Provide lifelong follow-up. Urinary diversion. Urinary diversion should be considered for women with overactive bladder only when conservative management has failed and if botulinum toxin A, percutaneous sacral nerve stimulation, and augmentation cystoplasty are not appropriate or are unacceptable to her. Provide lifelong follow-up. Surgical approaches for stress urinary incontinence. When offering a surgical procedure, Discuss with the woman the risks and benefits of the different treatment options for stress urinary incontinence. If conservative management for stress urinary incontinence has failed, offer synthetic mid-urethral tape or open colpo suspension or autologous rectus facial sling. Synthetic tapes. When offering synthetic mid-urethral tape procedure, Surgeons should use procedures and devices for which there is a current high-quality evidence of efficacy and safety, only use a device that they have been trained to use, use a device manufactured from type 1 macroporous polypropylene tape, and consider using a tape colored for high visibility for ease of insertion and revision. If women are offered a procedure involving the transsubturator approach, make them aware of the lack of long-term outcome data. Refer women to an alternative surgeon if their chosen procedure is not available from the consulting surgeon. Use a top-down retropubic tape approach only as part of a clinical trial. Offer a follow-up appointment including vaginal examination to exclude erosion within six months to all women who have had continence surgery. Colpo suspension. Do not offer laparoscopic colpo suspension as a routine procedure for the treatment of stress urinary incontinence in women. Only an experienced laparoscopic surgeon working in a multidisciplinary team with expertise in the assessment and treatment of urinary incontinence should perform the procedure. Biological slings. Do not offer anterior colporaphy, needle suspensions, paravaginal defect repair, and the Marshall Marchetti Kranz procedure for the treatment of stress urinary incontinence. Intramural bulking agents. Consider intramural bulking agents such as silicon, carbon coated zirconium beads, or hyaluronic acid or dextran copolymer for the management of stress urinary incontinence if conservative management has failed. Women should be made aware that repeat injections may be needed to achieve efficacy, efficacy diminishes with time, and efficacy is inferior to that of synthetic tapes or autologous rectus facial slings. Do not offer autologous fat and polythetrafluoroethylene Use as intramural bulking agents for the treatment of stress urinary incontinence. Artificial urinary sphincter. In view of the associated morbidity, the use of an artificial urinary sphincter should be considered for the management of stress urinary incontinence in women only if previous surgery has failed. Lifelong follow-up is recommended. Considerations following unsuccessful invasive stress urinary incontinence procedures or recurrence of symptoms. Women whose primary surgical procedure for stress urinary incontinence has failed, including women whose symptoms have returned, should be referred to tertiary care for assessment, such as repeat urodynamic testing, including additional tests, such as imaging, and urethral function studies 
and discussion of treatment options by the multidisciplinary team or offered advice if the woman does not want continued invasive stress urinary incontinence procedures.